The Playful Library. The Playful Library. The Playful Library. Yeah, really? You know what? It's a bit like saying the Playful Courtroom. The Playful Bank. The Playful Hospital. Oh, wait a minute. You know what? In these changing and anxious times, libraries are a target for all kinds of assumptions. Education, as we've heard this morning, is facing similar assumptions. That because we live in an age of information ubiquity, certain systems and processes, and people attached to those traditional systems and processes are no longer relevant. Well, to those assumptions, I say, good. But, beware. Because with those assumptions, you've just targeted the most skillful, resourceful, and adaptable segments of society. You'd better be prepared for the unexpected. You'd better be prepared to get on the action. And you'd better be prepared to play. Because libraries are really adept at mobilising information and resources in order to engage people. I believe technology is a core ingredient and games are a key process. Two months ago, I was in the computer lab at the State Library with 18 children aged 10 to 14, boys and girls, playing Minecraft. Been a popular game this morning. And one of the wonderful things of spending two days with children in this lab playing Minecraft was that the feedback that they said was that actually being together, seeing each other, talking with each other, working together, leaning over each other's shoulder and going, oh, just move that and put it over there. And, oh, wait, how did you do that? That was the best thing they loved as compared to being at home alone playing online. And parents inundated us with calls. They were pleasantly surprised that, oh my God, you're doing Minecraft in the library. How cool. And when I asked one of the children to show me what they'd been doing, he said, oh, I've built a blimp for me and my friends to take a journey inside Minecraft and so that we can have a look down on the world that we've created. I said, can you show me what's inside the blimp? So he took me on a bit of a tour inside and I had to smile when he showed me that one of the things he put in there was a library. <laughs> he brought his experience and what he valued in the physical world into the creativity of the digital world. So this is happening more and more and this is where libraries can experiment with the resources and the passion to create these beautiful spaces. Because after all, what have libraries got to lose? We've got the role of powerful games, we've got collaborative play, we've got the opportunity to link with communities. These are the things that provide the opportunities for libraries to engage. And if anything, games in libraries, they're a safe, disruptive activity, which is why I love them. Well, I mean, after all, you know, gamers are operating with an upgraded set of R's these days. They're reading, they're reacting, they're repeating, and they're reflecting. But, again, as we've heard today, the idea of the gamer has, again, all sorts of assumptions attached to it. Assumptions that libraries know all too well. That with what we perceive to be what gamers do and what libraries do, I actually don't think is the problem with these assumptions. It's the assumptions about play and where play happens and what play looks like. As if... Well, if you've got a book in your hands versus a controller or a mobile device, then somehow you're not really learning and that's not really valuable and you need to stop doing that and pick up a book. So these are the opportunities that libraries have to try and shift the experience and shift the assumptions. And if anything, I imagine that libraries can change themselves from being information service providers to being inspiration service providers. Let's turn those assumptions into anticipation about what I'm going to experience in this place or through this portal of the library online. I've found games programs in libraries to be amazing social experiments which are consistently positive. You know, spaces like libraries are the great nexus of old and new. And I think Dan Turnsian from the LA Times said it best, 
when he said, the digital revolution should spark library evolution. Again, libraries do know this all too well. And if anything, I think part of the digital evolution is that libraries have the opportunity to build a games collection. One that actually is of significant cultural value, but also promotes the custodial, custodial role of libraries. And in building this with the community, we let them tell us their stories. It's not the other way around. So I want to cover today four basic points. And I've made it reasonably easy for you by using the word play. Uh, basically, these stand for participate, learn, activity, and youth. These are the core ingredients, I believe, to create a playful library. So if we're going to get people to participate, let's start with libraries and actually many of the organisations that you work in. Let's stop calling people users and clients and customers and let's call them participants and invite them in to participate in the life of the library. Use social media networks to hide clues and codes online and on site and that the problem solver then gets to take that code and go and hide it somewhere else in their favourite section of the library or their favourite book. We could invite different communities like IGDAM, the, the International Game Developers Association of Melbourne and the Royal Society of Victoria or the Public Records Office of Victoria. Let's put them in a room together, shake it up and see what happens. I've always wanted to run a Connect Hack workshop where people use collection material and data and interact and discover in, use, in all sorts of new ways. See, games offer a lovely opportunity for people to participate and interact with spaces and collections. But it's not just about that. The other part here is about faces and not facades. You see, we need to try and openly celebrate the expertise of people inside the organisation and acknowledge the wisdom coming from outside. And in doing so, we start to realise that what's on the shelves in libraries only sells one quarter of the potential because we're missing out on the spaces and the programs and, of course, the people. Many libraries have created these online research tools called LibGuides. And often with them, there's a little profile about the librarian who's put all their effort into amassing all this knowledge and this process together. And they're a lovely way to discover that person's passion and their expertise. Games help create experiences with people that are memorable. And we've seen and heard a lot of these stories this morning. So it's not information that's just for memory anymore. Collaboration, as a result, often emerges when we open up ourselves to these things. And a great man once said, use the force, Luke. And with the force of push and pull, we need to think about ways to push people online for deep experiences that they can explore themselves and interact with others. And we want to pull people on site when we want human connection and human collaboration. I've done a game event at the library where people played games at the same time online with children down at the Royal Children's Hospital and were so pleasantly surprised and got so much uh, a value from that experience in the same way that only a couple of weekends ago I was involved with the International Games Day, which was started by the American Library Association in 2009 and has now spread around the globe with thousands of libraries participating and many of them right here in Melbourne. There's a library in Finland that's created a game to help people solve the problems with optical character recognition or OCR of digitised records, trying to promote people to be moles and discover mistakes and earn rewards for solving them. But, you know, solving things and learning these things is only part of, the, part of the challenge. And when I'm talking about learning here, I'm not talking about what kids and visitors can learn from games. I'm talking about what we need to learn about games. Organisations like libraries need to learn what makes games compelling. What games make people stop and think? We have plenty of books about them for a start. Through social interaction and games programs, we learn with and from others. 
So much of what the internet has shown us is that it's patterns and pieces, not sorry, patterns and not pieces that are becoming clearer. Experimentation and fun, surprise, curiosity, these are the powerful motivators. Like games, fail and repeat are part of the process and success is always just within reach. A few years ago we developed an educational program called the Hoddle Waddle which was based on the grid of, uh, uh, designed by Robert Hoddle in the mid 19th century. And we created various trails for students to discover clues as they went around Melbourne so that they could experience the city and see the city armed with new information. But it was kind of flawed. It didn't quite work. And I think one of the opportunities here and one of the opportunities missed is to try and make it a much richer narrative experience. A bit like the Dragon Collective certainly is becoming. And given that games are such a rich narrative experience, this means that libraries are, the one of the, again, one of the best place, place, places to learn about how to be playful with these experiences. But again, you can't have experiences unless you have activity. You need energy and variety and programming to try and build a community around these things. So libraries have always offered people something they can't get at home. But through social activities, we can actually start to build and acknowledge a community rather than just provide services for individuals. A couple of years ago, I was involved in starting a series uh, called Outside in Cinema, which was an opportunity to screen films inside the library during winter. We put out deck chairs and, and some films from our collection. Now, over the years, we've worked much, closely, much, much more closely with our partners, including Madman and the Student Youth Network, and we've built it into a program that's got a wonderful community behind it and lots of links to our collections. Word spread and it got bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, why can't we do this with games? Imagine doing a series on games that covered the themes of politics, economics, history, language, music, science. Games programs can create change. They can bring the outside in. We just need to let communities come in and help shape what needs to happen. And virtually all the games initiatives that I've been involved in have actually been shaped by external communities looking for an opportunity and needing the energy and the space to do so. And these things actually haven't cost a lot of money, which is why, as Gordon McKenzie puts it, they are the sweet dividends of prudent ingenuity. In other words, the payoffs for going where the energy takes you that often cost next to nothing. And if we're going to use some energy, then we're going to need some youth. And youth, again, as we've been hearing repeatedly, they are not idle visitors to our organisations and institutions. We need to give them a reason to be acknowledged and to be recognised in the contribution they can make. And I really love the concept of ap apophenia, which is making connections where none previously existed. and is the byline of Dana Boyd's blog and is well worth a read. And the kinds of things we can do through this is we can augment the experience. We can make spaces and objects talk with AR. We can do this now. We can extend the engagement by offering talks and expos and workshops for young people and by young people. And we can enhance the engagement by giving young people an opportunity to discover and dig deeper into the rich resources that libraries can offer. And then help them build the networks for richer, deeper learning. You know, someone once said that books aren't dead. They've just gone digital. Well, reading isn't dead. It's just gone digital. Learning isn't dead. It's just gone digital. Games were never dead. But they've gone digital too. In making libraries playful spaces, we have the opportunity to do things differently, to shake things up. And I don't believe it will stir those who still expect libraries to perform the traditional functions. Something that has driven me all these years was said by the director of the Stockholm Public Library a couple of years ago, when she said, when people in motion meet a library in motion, 
anything is possible. Thank you. Some questions for Hamish. Yes. Um, hi, Hamish. Um, my mum's a librarian. Um, although she's in her 70s, she's very, um, actually quite progressive. But how do you find this sort of culture of activity in the library as opposed to silence, um, sort of empowering people as opposed to providing services, fits with, say, some of the more traditional law? Older people in the library world. Uh, I think the challenges are the same as they are in education and school contexts, that they challenge the norms of what people have always done. Again, I think it's by showing people these experiences and the kinds of people and the opportunities it offers, people quickly realise that they've had their blinkers on uh, and that games are not a threat, they're not disruptive in the sense of uh, noise, which is the, one of those eternal things in libraries. Um, and I think that's shifting. I think people are acknowledging there are times and spaces which need to be designated for, for noise. And it's that classic thing even about school, that sometimes many teachers have the mindset that a quiet classroom is engagement. And there's a whole other group of teachers that go, the noisy classroom is engagement. And I, I think libraries have to work out how to let those two things coexist. Uh, there's a resistance, absolutely, but I think that resistance is the challenge to us to show how can we demonstrate how the two can, can live nicely together. Are you aware that the Alberta Foundation Yes. What's our chance? I mean, if you look at what this is, the course has just come out of what they've achieved Yeah. Uh, look, I, I, I hope it will happen. I don't know that it, that it will just yet. Um, I mean, part of the excitement that I get when I hear the announcement about this morning about $20 million going into game development, right, so I'm thinking, <laughs> all right, so, so how can other organisations use that as a leverage? Are you looking for the space to bring those people together to create something? Can, what, what can we do to help you maximise that. And it's not about trying to cash in on anything. It's actually, now that you've got the backing and people are going to start to accept it more, this is our opportunity now to start to link up the networks. Um, you know, I, when, when MacArthur put up $2 million to the American Library Association to seed games in libraries, everyone paid attention because everyone wanted in on the action. Uh, and as I said, you know, it's now spread around the world and, and maybe it is simply momentum and critical mass that will help that shift. It is. Yeah, it's well. Yeah, it's well worth having a look. Yeah, at the NGD ALA site. Yeah. Okay.